Chapter 14. The sun beat down strongly and brightly. It felt more like midday in the summer than four in the afternoon in April. But that was how this country went, directly from way too cold to far too hot. Spring lasted about two days. I was feeling so hot that I wanted to take off my jacket, but figured it was the best to leave it on. Better to fit in. All the street people still had on their coats and toques and in a couple of cases gloves. Either they hadn't noticed a change in weather, or they were just so grateful not to be cold anymore that they wanted to get as hot as possible. Maybe store a little heat for when they needed it again next winter. I started to recognize some of the faces of those hats. I'd say hello or nodded to a number of people I'd passed. I'm sure there were more than I knew, but it was hard because they never looked up, never made eye contact with people passing by. Even when they were begging, changed, their eyes were always focused firmly on the ground. Beautiful day, eh? I turned toward the voice. It was Jack. It's a great day. Sun feels good against my face, he said. That was about the only part of him showing. Like everybody else, he was still wore his thick coat and toque. You on your way to the club? Yep. Mind if I walk along with you in that direction? Of course not. He fell into step beside me. So how did things work out with the school assignment? You know, the interview. Really well. I'm pretty well guaranteed to pass now. And you weren't before, he asked, sounding concerned? It was sort of a touch and go for a while, I admitted. That doesn't make sense. Smart kid like you should be doing more than just passing. You should be getting good marks. That's what my parents keep saying. Then it's probably true. So what stops you from getting better marks? I guess I just don't work hard enough. You can't get anywhere without working hard. It was strange to be given advice about working hard from a man who was living in a tent, but somehow the world's words rang true coming out of his mouth. I knew that he'd been somebody who had worked hard, who had taken pride in what he did, that just made where he was now so much sadder. Are you going to eat in the club tonight, I asked. Maybe, but maybe not. We'll see. I just figured you were heading in that direction, so you were... I stopped mid-sentence. Were you going in this direction, or were you thinking it would be safer if I had an escort? Two people are always safer than one, he with a grin. Maybe I thought it would be safer for me to be with you. Yeah, right, like you need my help. We all need help. He was serious now. Some people just don't get the help they need. Those last words struck hard. Was he talking about himself and the rest of the people in living the streets or the people of Rwanda? Those that he couldn't help, or stranger still, was, ta was he talking about me? When the sun beats down so brightly, I can't help thinking of other places, he said. Like Rwanda, I asked. Like Rwanda. I just can't believe that I didn't know that most people still don't know what happened there. He shrugged. Human nature is to look away from what's unpleasant. Ignorance is bliss. If you look, you might have to do something about it. I guess. I'm still just trying to understand how all that could have happened. I spent lots of years trying to understand it, he said. And if you figure it out, you tell me, okay, he asked. I will. I was reading about the convoys, I said. You know about the convoys, he asked, sounding surprised. I know a little. I'm just surprised you know anything about them. I'm interested, I explained. He stared straight ahead. I suddenly started to think better of this. Maybe it wasn't fair for me to bring it up. You don't have to talk about it if you don't want. I don't want to bring back any more bad memories. You can't bring back what never leaves. But don't worry, the convoys are one of the few parts I feel good about. I'd like to know more about them. He nodded in agreement but didn't answer right away. I knew he was thinking through his answer, deciding what to say, and probably just as important what not to say. There were certain places we called enclaves where the Tutsus were gathered and we could provide them with some level of safety, some. But we knew that the sharks circling around would eventually stop respecting those fragile boundaries. It was just a matter of time. We had to move them to the territory call controlled by the rebels. So you put them in the trucks and convoyed them out? We did the best we could. You have to understand that our mission in Rwanda, almost all UN missions, are underfunded, undermanned, and under-equipped. Not enough troops or trucks, tents or toilet paper. Not even enough ammunition. Ammunition? You mean like bullets? Like bullets, he said, nodding in agreement. We didn't have enough rounds of ammunition to survive a battle. We didn't have the man or the muscle to force our way out of these enclaves. So we had to wait for the right time and hope we could bluff our way through the roadblocks, through the militia and through the mobs. That would have been terrifying. I mean, I would have been terrified. So was I. So were all. That surprised me. I just didn't think of him as somebody who would be scared. He glanced at me. You didn't think I was scared, he asked? My expression must have given me away. I guess not. To not be scared would have been to not understand. I was scared when I had to fight those three thugs. Fear is always with you. 
You just can't let it overwhelm you. I think you would have responded well if you were with me. Me? I couldn't even handle those punks in the park. Don't underestimate yourself, Ian. I know people. I know you would have acted in an honourable manner. The way you acted, I question. The way I try my best to act. We walked along in silence for a while. I think I'd pushed him too far, or maybe he'd pushed both of us too far. How many people do you think were saved by convoys? Thousands, perhaps tens of thousands? You had to feel really good about that. It's hard to feel good about saving thousands when hundreds of thousands perished. What we did was just a drop in the bucket. We continued to walk, but not talk. I knew we were sharing the same thoughts. Here you are, Jack said, and we stopped in front of the club. There were already five men waiting by the front doors. You want to come in and get something to eat, I asked. You could come right in with me now. That wouldn't be fair to the guys waiting outside, he said, gesturing to the line. It would be different if you came in and offered help with the setup, I said. He gave me a questioning look. Mac always needs help, I explained. You know, I might want to do that sometime, but not tonight. Some other time. I know Mac would appreciate the help. Maybe you could come back later, talk to him about it, and get supper. He shook his head. Not tonight. Not hungry. Okay, I'll see you later. You too. Be safe, he said. Jack started to walk away and then stopped and turned around. You know, in the beginning, my greatest fear was that I would be killed. At the end, my greatest fear was that I wouldn't be. He turned and walked away. I stood there, too stunned to move, too stunned to speak. As he walked away, he pulled a bottle out from inside of his coat and tipped it back in his mouth. Maybe there are things he couldn't forget, but that wasn't stopping him from trying. Either that or trying to die.